know that the logistic, uh, if you go to the online portal, then uh, if you click on Professor C, you see all uh, my contact information, uh, the teaching assistance, the contact information, taxi and doctor, and uh, social media information will be updated also later on today. So all of your contact information is right there. That's one thing. Every 
company will have a different set of parameters that are relevant to them. And the other parameters lead to a second or a third or a tenth order effect. But all the others, one or two, will become very important in each box. And they are the ones that determine the character of your company and the character of your revenue, the character of the business, and the character of the value that you will get for your companies. Okay, so. Is there any questions on the BMC business model canvas? Yes. Sir, uh, value propositions and their uh, customer relations. Like they are sometimes like you want to offer to the customer in value proposition. And what we like how we offer is customer, like what is customer relationship like that? Okay, so good question. So what's a customer relationship? So customer relationship is how the company connects with the customer. Is it on a one-to-one -one basis? So, you know, if you're a customer of a brokerage firm, buying and selling stock, then it's one broker contacting one customer. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, when you buy toothpaste, do you think Godrej has a one-to-one -one relationship with you? It's a channel relationship. <laughs> so it's a relationship through a shop or through a Distributor or mail order or direct mail or web, web uh, So the relationship that the customer has with the company varies depending on the kind of business you're building. So based on that, you have your company's character changes. A company that has got a lot of one to one customer relationships, in that case, you're going to have. Basically, what's called a premium product you're selling. Basically, each customer you have to, you're going to spend a lot of time following, following up, relating to the customer. So it's going to be expensive. People are expensive, people's time is expensive. So you've got to be able to sell to each customer a lot of value, maybe 10 lakhs or 5 lakh rupees of value every year, so that if you can support 20 customers per broker. You can generate 10 to 20 or 1 kilo of business for the broker. Right? So, when we write value proposition, will we not also say that, alright, my value proposition is like I am dealing one on one? Is that not a value proposition? Yeah, so basically the value proposition is not that you're going to deal one on one, but that you're going to provide premium customized service. So that actually takes you straight from there to maybe one on one is the right way to do or it might be a combination of some, you know, chat that you service you provide or a direct number that you provide that they can call. So you can also provide direct access to a call center. So you can provide your premium customer, you know, care in many different ways. There doesn't have to be a person call. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. So, 
the customer relationship, yes, at the gross level you have to have pretty much similar. But now when you start going into the detail, when you start writing your business plan after you do customer discovery, and we're going to go into discovery today a little bit in more detail, you'll see that really you have to really do research in order to figure out how you're going to win the marketplace. Remember, competitors, uh, if you have a successful and profitable business, there are going to be lots of competitors. And everybody is going to try to do one better than you in some way or the other. And so, find out the understanding that you have of, you know, what, uh, how you're going to deliver something some of your, back, your products and services superior to the competition is going to determine your success. Yes, I have one point here. Yes. Uh, in the first class, we saw this example of Indian entrepreneurs. One of them we saw was the cabin care, sea care and apple. What he did was the new value proposition. That means he made a large segment of the population which was not buying today the cosmetics or the toiletries or shampoos. He said that only pay one rupee and get the experience. So he created a new value proposition that instead of spending 100 or 200 rupees, spending by one rupee, you can get that benefit and want to invest money in that. So that's a new type of value proposition. Yes. Well, yes. Innovation inherently about this process? Absolutely. Very, very good question. Basically, most companies will enter an existing product market with an innovation in a specific area. If you look at Amazon, you know, we could all buy, you know, books, we could buy electronics, we could buy all the products that Amazon is selling through specific stores, right? You can go to a physical store and get it. And they innovated in delivery, you know, in ordering and delivery. They innovated on both sides. They give you more choice, access right from your home, and then delivery right to your doorstep. So you can innovate in many different ways, but as you innovate, you change the entire competitive situation. So all of a sudden, all the companies that have big physical stores, where real estate was very expensive, customer had to drive, etc., found that you know, all the business had moved to online delivery. And all of a sudden, their business started dropping. And they said, we have not done anything different. Why the customers not coming? But basically, there was a competitive change in the marketplace. And it happened somewhere in these nine parameters. So, as an entrepreneur, you use this chart on an aggressive mode, but also on a defensive mode. When you already have your business, you're defending the business. So you're defending it by continuously watching what everybody is doing and how the underlying ecosystem is changing, right? The ecosystem that changed was what? In uh, the electronics market, book market. The ecosystem that changed was, number one, internet came along so that everybody had access to internet. Then databases became fast. So you could easily search the database and shoot the product. Security for the transaction became reliable and something that people trusted. Otherwise, people did not even trust with the credit card. So the security portion of the business, which is the transaction portion, if that had not changed, Amazon would have still failed. So many different things in the ecosystem changed. When all the important building blocks in the ecosystem come and are ready to go, if you are late at that point, even big companies get wiped out. And if you notice, just in the last uh, 20, 25 years that uh, you guys have been, that, that, we, that you've been living, uh, you find that already some big companies have pretty much disappeared. And you would say, how can a company with you know, 30,000 employees, the number one company in the marketplace, disappear, right? I mean, we've seen steel companies in India disappear. We've seen, you know, uh, 
clothing companies, if you notice, all the mills, Katao mills, Mosaka mills, all the textile mills in Bombay are gone. I mean, when I was there, you know, 20% of Bombay traffic in the trains used to be people workers going to the mills to work. And lower parade methods, all of that used to be textile companies. Is there a single textile company in Bombay left, right? So, some of the other, and yet people are very close, right? <laughs> so, obviously, somebody else figured out a different way to provide uh, clothes. And, uh, you know, obviously, the biggest beneficiary of this was Relax, right? So, Hirobe and Bani, in a way, did. In a few specific ways, especially in the cost, delivery, and uh, quality of polyester clothing, which really destroyed all the textile companies out there that were just focusing on cotton, on, you know, cotton clothing. So the economy of scale, the size huh? of the operations, the economy of scale. Yeah, economy of scale. The quality, and then for India, like you know, you sell something for yes to you don't have to iron the clothes, it dries the quick dry. A lot of other benefits came from polyester clothing. And all these cotton mills went out of business. Can you imagine? How many people lost their jobs because somewhere in the ecosystem something changed, the value proposition changed. And these existing companies didn't realize. I mean, right now you're seeing it happen in the high-tech business. You're seeing Microsoft and you're seeing Google. Now, who expected, you know, the operating system when the, the Microsoft Office, where, you know, 80, 90 percent of the world was using Microsoft Office. And now, you know, it's under threat. It will probably not be relevant. Uh, I was already started losing its relevancy, and maybe the whole company will be affected uh, in the next five years. Who knows? So, uh, but you know, uh, yeah. I think it's such an important point that I think you have made. Uh, in fact, you must have heard the name Peter Drucker, who is a management guru. And Peter Drucker says that the most important function of an entrepreneur is innovation. Without that, there is no possibility. In fact, the first book on entrepreneurship written uh, in this uh, arena is by Peter Drucker and title is Innovation and Entrepreneurship. So I will see here that unless you gain a better superior value proposition, there is no entrepreneur. And there can't be any better value proposition unless there is innovation. So they are completely linked. Without that, we can't really go. Right. And innovation is not just in the value proposition. It is in customer relationship. Yes, it can be. It is in the customer segments you are talking in the channel. It can be the key activity. It can be the key partnerships, key resources. And it just takes one little thing. And all of a sudden you find that you know, nobody is buying the product and the whole business is open to competition. Good questions. Any more? Yeah. So I think that often this is the lack of Quick question. 
question. What do you think Sinto did that gave that an opportunity or a toehold to build a billion dollar business? Compared to the all of these guys are also smart people. With you know, Withdraw, Posis, PCS, Accenture, IBM Global Services, and there's a hundred other uh, services companies, right? IT services companies. So what was in your opinion, uh, what Bharat might have said uh, in the presentation. In fact, it's there in his logo. Consider it done. Right? So, he was giving, he continuously, everybody else gives different messages. If you look at Accenture brand tag positioning, Infosys tag positioning, they're all going to be slightly different. And Bharat wanted to give the message that you give me the project, you don't have you can go sleep peacefully. You don't have to worry about it. I will take away your worries. So consider IT done. Because a lot of IT projects used to be have cost overruns, used to be delayed, you know, and uh, Products were not done perfectly and then they would have to be fixed and so on. And Bharat built a reputation in the marketplace for getting IT projects done to customer satisfaction, maybe even bit more than what the customer was expecting every time. And you notice that he was rated the same as IBM for all those, you know, 25,000 companies in the world. Even though it's just a billion dollar company, IBM is a hundred billion dollar company. So the point is that, you know, everybody has pretty much the same BMC for all IT services. But he focused on having a customer relationship where the customer was super satisfied on delivery of the <coughs> So this is the kind of, you know, uh, subtleties that you have to work on. And we talk about in the next uh, one hour as to how, you know, when I build, you know, the three different companies of the selected and dino, how did I find that middle competitive advantage that allowed me to build a four hundred million dollar semiconductor company against when all the big companies were there, Intel, ESA, etc. How did it allow me to build a five billion dollar enterprise software customer company? And all of these were there. How did I find the market segment? The market YouTube was there, and everything was there. So the point is, how is it done? And that's customer discovery.
engineering process. So engineering process is always go with the hypothesis that oh, I bet this thing can be done faster this way, or this thing can be done, uh, you know, something that the customer will enjoy if I do this. So that's a hypothesis. Then you design an experiment. Experiment is let's make something that looks like this equipment and and you know see if the customer likes it. Design experiment. Then you test it. Then you do all the statistical analysis on the results. Then you suddenly get the insight. Now, this is you know um, the way that you know you would study this in engineering. But real life is unfortunately different. We don't have that much time, opportunity, and we have already kind of figured out all the answers, <coughs> do all the standard answers. So, uh, how did I do it, right? For building real companies. So how do you get insights in a real startup, in a, in a real world situation? And that is most important. So, for example, you'll hear this very important word, on early evangelism. It's a concocted word. It means early and evangelist. Evangelist is anybody? Who's the evangelist? Somebody who who's yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. Exactly. So it's basically somebody who so believes in something in product that was or, or some or some item that he wants to tell everybody about it. Right? So typically there is in Christianity there's a whole group of <coughs> section of Christians who are called evangelists and they are believe they believe in promoting you know, Christianity. So evangelist is one word and early is somebody who's early to it. So Every business or every market segment, you will find that there are people who have a vision. There are customers who have a vision. Customers who know what they want. They just don't know how to get it, but who know what they want. So these people are called early evangelists. So uh, here, you know, Dino, uh, sorry, Selectica have developed this artificial intelligence based configurator, right? So it was something and we imported it to the internet. So it was something that allowed us to use artificial intelligence, cutting edge software, in order to do very complex configuration of networks and, and cars and everything uh, right there on the internet. So, we had come up with this amazing technology. Now, how do we use it? How, who do we sell it to? So, you know, we said, who can we sell this to? We can sell this to, you know, who's got the toughest configuration problem? We said. Oh, it looks like telecom networks would be very complex. Or network products like routers, etc., like Cisco's products would be very complex or a computer system would be very complex. So maybe there's a, a need for this kind of sophisticated configurator. And, uh, you know, we just made a list of 50 telcos, another 20 networking companies that started calling, hey, you have a problem like this. Do you think you can use some new technology? And, uh, you know, most people are already solving those problems. There's always some solution existing before you came up with your idea, right? They're still selling networks, they're still selling telcos, they're still building computers. So obviously they already had a solution that they were using, you know, something.